ました。Back, we're live. I'm Jake Fidel. This is Think Tank. We're covering coronavirus as much as we can. We want to do our part in the community understanding of what's going on, and we are we are actually covering it pretty well. We probably have 65 shows already about coronavirus, and we're having more all the time from various parts of the community. And today, the part of the community <laughs> we're talking to is Larry Grimm. Um, he's a, a hospice worker, a rehabilitation. Uh, worker, and he's going to talk to us about uh, about the the most vulnerable members of our community. That is the Kapuna, uh, and of course, this is aging uh, with grace, which is the name of the show. Larry does has done with us from time to time. Uh, welcome back, Larry. It's nice to see your smiling face to the extent that I can see it under the mask. Yeah, tell us about the mask. <laughs> so this is a paper mask. This is a, a simple mask. And it's um, used to be really available right now. These are provided by my Bristol Hospice. And we use them when we go into facilities. And it does because one thing, it keeps me from aerosol, sending aerosols out to other people when I talk or sneeze or if I cough. And uh, that's very important to keep in front of a kapuna. It also protects me from aerosols coming in. Uh, into my face if someone sneezes or coughs at me. But also the third thing it does is it says to the facility and to the patients and family that we have a con I have a consciousness what's going on. And I have a concern people that I relate to. I'm at home alone right now, so I'm going to unveil myself. <laughs> Don't touch your face. Well, I, uh... I yeah, don't touch your face with or without the. So uh, yeah, I, I you know, you're a minister also, and uh, there have been uh, some interesting uh, pieces in the paper about prayer, about uh, religious organizations getting together to pray. Uh, this this is grouping, and uh, I guess it depends on exactly how you organize the group and how you pray, um, but uh, it's been a source of um, of contagion, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. You know, the power of prayer. It works alone, you know, individually, but it also works in groups, and groups may not be the best way to go lately. You got any thoughts about that? Yes, I'm a Presbyterian minister, and I'm working as a chaplain, a spiritual care provider for hospice. Some of them uh, go through their end of life process, and mine just and marshal all the spiritual resources they have. Sometimes those spiritual resources are communities and churches that are praying for them and people who care about them. Uh, and this time right now, I am very upset about um, about churches and congregations and gather people who gather intimately in a prayer group and uh, violate the, the social distancing. Uh, it, it is, to me, it's like, it's akin to the snake handlers, you know, the snake handlers who say, oh, yeah, the Bible says we can handle snakes. So let's get a few snakes out and throw them around. And Yeah, they're venomous, but they won't bite because God will protect me. Well, I, I God didn't give me a mind and give us minds and, and capable uh, analytical capabilities in order to abandon them and get throw them away and call that faith. I disagree that, with that totally. So. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very upset about Liberty University that called students back in to close contact and ah, and other churches <clears throat> that are violating this very wise uh, mandate to keep a distance. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about uh, hospices, rehabilitations. Uh, let's talk about um, you know uh, how how life has changed for you as a, a hospice worker. Uh, and for the, the patients in a hospice, uh, there must be mm -hmm. some significant changes going on because of the vulnerability of the people in the hospice or the rehabilitation hospital. 
Yeah, there very much, <clears throat> there very much is. Um, <clears throat> In, in terms of facilities, Jay, the facilities are taking a strong um, positive uh, uh, policy and practice of some of them barring care visitors totally, not even family members are allowed in. And some of them bar our hospice care, except for a minister, except for, uh, for the uh, nurses and the healthcare assistants in order to uh, make sure that the, the number of contacts are limited. Um, and I think that's, again, a very wise thing to do. It, it's not some of the family members because family members may come and from long distance and want to be in contact, but can't do that. But that's really precisely the issue. And as 14 day quarantine is on people who arrive on the islands, that Governor Ige has put in place, as hard as that is, it's so wise because I don't know, we don't know who they have been in contact with back at home in uh, Washington or in California or in, um, in China or in, in Asian countries in South Korea. And when they come, they can possibly bring the virus with them. and. They get around mom, grandma who's dying and they want to hug her and they want to hold her and embrace her uh, in their family love and they can impart the virus to them. And before we know it, the virus has le leapt from that person onto a healthcare worker or onto a, another um, friend who comes to visit and um, or onto a chaplain who's sitting by. Uh, one, one of the experiences I had, Jay, was <clears throat> with a one of my um, Japanese <clears throat> background, just there. She has family that travel back and forth to Japan. And she um, she and I usually have convers uh, no conversation because she doesn't speak. But I sit with her and, I, and she looks at me and I look at her and, and uh, meditate together. Well, I was sitting with her the other day and all of a sudden she sneezed. <laughs> and I was... I was six feet away, fortunately, but, but she just let out a huge sneeze, uh, totally unexpected. And it wasn't like she usually sneezes when I go to visit. So I wasn't anticipating that. But in that sneeze, I, I didn't know what could have been in that sneeze. And um, I, get a, I, I ended the visit immediately. But um, it was just a, a kind of microcosm of what but healthcare workers face all the time, not mm -hmm. knowing what all could be present in that sneeze. Yeah. So that's that's part of the care for the healthcare workers and for the community. And I think it's really important. And um, so that's one of the ways in which things have changed dramatically. The other part of that, of course, Jay, is is the um, is the is protecting the patient themselves because they are. And very vulnerable, very vulnerable to the COVID. And, and our purpose in hospice care, purpose in all of the facilities also that care for them, is to make their life comfortable. That's palliative care. Make it comfortable, peaceful, um, an end that will be for all, better, better or for worse, as pleasant as can be. And um, if we allow someone to come in with COVID-19 and that uh, with the patient who is so vulnerable, then the patient is bound to have a, a horrible ending um, if it takes root, which it likely will. Would, uh, can I bring up that sheet, Jay? Yeah, let's look at your sheet. Larry has made a sheet of, uh, you know, uh, questions for visitors and empowering kupuna, very important. So, Larry, why don't you go through the points on the sheet? I think it's very important you do that. I'd like to. Thank you, Jay. Well, first of all, uh, um, my, my interest here in, is enabling kupuna um, to be empowered. So if, uh, if you're at home, for instance, and you're in the uh, vulnerable age group, whatever it is, or if you're in the vulnerable um, situation, as we'll define it a little bit here, you can be able, you have a reason to ask these questions of people. Now, these are the questions that I get asked, Jay, you ask change for us when I go in to visit somebody. 
I get my temperature taken usually. And I was 90, 98.5 this morning. I get my temperature taken. And then I am asked these questions. And I think they're questions that anybody can ask of a visitor who comes. Show those back up again, Eric, would you please? So who's vulnerable? Well, everybody, in a way. I once said, uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, the physician, uh, Dr. The physician of, uh, on the task force said, everybody's vulnerable. This is a novel virus, which means in, there is no herd immunity. There's no shared immunity. So everyone in the world is, is vulnerable. There is no immunity in any human being. Secondly, those who are over 60, uh, they also have a certain vulnerability because our, uh, our bodily functions begin to dwindle sometimes. Also, those who have any kind of history of respiratory illness, they are very vulnerable, vulnerable because this virus attaches the throat and then moves down into the lungs. And one, one person has uh, had COVID-19, was talking about it on, on uh, Facebook the other, yesterday, and he said, this thing turns your lungs to glass. I mean, that of lung turning to glass is just a horrible image, Jay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, so anybody who has those uh, possibility, those vulnerabilities has a right to ask questions of people coming into their space. And, and, um, and certainly that's what, what the uh, facilities do to protect the patient. So the question is, let's see, have you been in contact? Have you traveled anywhere? Have you traveled outside of the country to any place? And we changed it here to have you left the island? Have you even traveled to the mainland? And we have you and uh, in the past 14 days, because 14 days is that incubation period. Is that the first one? Have you or someone you know? Yeah in the last 14 days. So if that answer is, if the answer to any of these four main questions is yes, then it's a good reason to say, hey, not now, come back. So this is this is not you theoretical, know. what you're reading, this is not theoretical, this sheet. You're actually doing this and acting on it, am I right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and, and then the next set of questions has to do with your health. Of the visitor, what's what's your temperature? Um, I'm a, I may uh, who are at home get a thermometer that uh, you can put up to the forehead and brush around the forehead. Take the temperature of anybody who comes to your home who wants to talk with you, and um, have a mask available if you want. If you're able, the N95 masks are just for the health care providers. They they shut out the percent of of all incoming virus and such. So you ask about the temperature, you had a headache. That's another indicator. Um, what's the third one there? What's that third one? Uh, I mean, you're having breathing difficulties. Um, all these show up again and again as we're hearing people talk about being in, in the realm, being, uh, uh, being a, a assessed as hazardous. It's a predictable, mm -hmm. predictable um, manifestation. It, it mm -hmm. shows up in the uh, shows up in the temperature. It shows up in breathing. It shows up in coughing. It shows up in headaches. It shows up in not sleeping well. And um, so, if anybody's coming around my kupuna, kupuna and uh, I want my kupuna to say, test this out with them. Don't don't let them come in to your space without knowing positive answers about this or negative yes. answers about this actually yes yes <clears throat> well so suppose uh, the could be able to so, are those all the questions now yeah suppose uh, one of your kupuna starts uh, experiencing these symptoms well I, I i hope it hasn't happened yet but suppose it does happen 
it's possible certainly in, in these times. Uh, what, what do you, what is, what's your plan? What are you going to do? Well, that's a good question. And we have one, one of our, one of our patients, as I understand it today, has one, uh, has signs of this. Um, at that point, that's really when the, um, the local facility takes well to help us to help get through it is if they're able to get through it. But um, are you are you going to be stuff. equipped? <clears throat> are you going to be equipped to take care of a, a sick a kubuna who has the virus, or do you have to refer that person out, or should you refer that person out because you know you have, you know you have the possibility of contagion to health workers who may not be as well prepared as in a hospital, and to other kupuna who are going to be, as we have said, very vulnerable. What do you do? We're going to do what we can inside the uh, facility to uh, make it make the process as easy as it can be and as caring as we can. Um, I, I'm, I'm suspecting it just all the pattern that everything is, we just have a respirator, protective gear, PPPE, we call it, which is the personal protective equipment, which is gown, gloves, face mask. There are some face masks that are shields across the whole face um, that are highly protected at that point for, for people who are close by. Um, and there may be some people uh, uh, who in the caring and in our hospice care who say, you know, I'm not sure I can do this. I don't want to be that close to it. Uh, and they may back away. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's so a risk uh, you know, that, that all healthcare workers have. And the question is whether it's a, it's a risk they undertook when they got in the job and in the situation or whether it's a surprise. And I would, I would imagine that in a hospice, a rehabilitation hospital circumstances, uh, environment, they, it would be a surprise for them. <clears throat> you know, one of the interesting yeah. things in, in the mayor's conference uh, here what, an hour ago um, was uh, Susan Ballard, the chief of police, uh, got up and, you know, told us uh, that the police were hyperactive and uh, they were, uh, they were you know, giving these citations, people who they thought were breaking, uh, you know, the, uh, the lockdown rules. <clears throat> but also, she said, that the police are very busy um, they're, they're like the first line of action when somebody feels that somebody in the household, or in your case, in the, in the hospice or the rehabilitation in the hospital, it has got the disease and they can't, they can't manage it. They don't have the PPE, they don't have a ventilator, they don't, you know, they don't have staff who's uh, able and willing to take care of this, but it's really not, not their cup of tea at all. And it, <clears throat> this individual, this patient has to go to the hospital. So who do they call? You know, I, I really hadn't thought about this. Who do they call? What are you going to do? You, you, know, you can call your doctor. I mean, I suppose you guys at the hospice have a doctor right there <clears throat> or at least available to you. Um, but what, what Ballard said was that they call more often than not 911 and the police respond and the police call <clears throat> the ambulance. And the police arranged for this patient to be taken taken into a facility which is, uh, you know, going to be able to treat treat the person and also which is safer for the community. I find that interesting because I, I don't think a lot of people have actually thought that through. What do you do when somebody you finally conclude that somebody's got all these symptoms and it's, you know there's no other conclusion to make? Um, what do they do? Well, maybe one one thing to do is just call nine one one. Um, you know, we, we still do have yes. hospital facilities here, you know. Yeah. Another, another thing that they, that can be done, Jay, is they can call, first call their PCP, their personal care provider, and say to the PCP, this is what's going on. And this, then you know my history. Uh, what do you think I should do? And the PCP will help make some judgment as to whether or not it's severe enough at this time to go in for critical care. And I, I think the, the important thing there is that they're, as the talk about flattening the curve, you know, trying to make it so that we don't get overwhelmed, the system doesn't get overwhelmed with, with all kinds of 
of uh, um, false alarms. Symptoms. That well, false alarms are early on in the stage of development that might okay. be that might that might be okay later on. You know that some people might develop an immunity to it and um, and be able to recover very well and much more quickly. But if if everybody who gets a sneeze goes to the emergency room, then we're in trouble with being able to support them, those who are really yeah. far along. Yeah. Well, so I'm you know I'm um, I'm just uh, wondering uh, how how it's going to work going forward. More, this is going to be more contagious, or at least more people are going to you know catch the contagion, and people are going to be more concerned about it. And the, uh, you know, you run the risk that the hospitals won't be able to handle the intake either by personnel or equipment. Um, and, you, and you guys will be tremendously burdened because the, whatever risk you perceive now today, it, it'll be worse, um, not only in the de facto, you know, level of risk, but in the, in the, in the fear, you know, the, the level of concern about the risk. So, um, and, and very troublesome is that the family, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, just everything is dynamic, isn't it? Everything changes, especially this, and we don't know where it's going to change to. Um, so you're you're in a and very think, interesting. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, that's another level. That's another issue, Jay, of the anxiety levels. When do we get most anxious? We get most anxious when we can't predict the future, and this is becoming more and more difficult to predict. And as much of as much information as we gather together, it still seems to be feeding the anxiety level. So, so that the and 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 I can feel it. It's an intuitive thing. But I when I go into a to a facility, I feel that anxiety level, you know, rising in the in the staff and um, how uncomfortable that is for them to live with that anxiety all day long and. Um, and yet the, the best thing for them is, as I see it, is to do the steps that we've done, outlined that are capable of helping us to determine what the virus is doing. The virus yeah, but one of the, the things that, one of the things you do, Larry, is you communicate with the patients. And that is, that's an art form yeah. all in itself. These people are already under stress. They're, you know, obviously worried about what the, what the future is for them. And um, they're trying to make peace with life in general. And um, yeah. so you, you have to be very nuanced about how you talk to them about this, about what you say to them. You are their source of information. It's like, you know, I was telling you that uh, my wife took this survey by the National Preparedness Disaster Preparedness mm -hmm. Training Center, which is being circulated now. And in fact, Think Tech has circulated it. Uh, one of the organizations circulating it. And one of the questions is, what else do you recommend? So she said, you know, I don't understand how the people in this community in Hawaii who don't speak English are getting their information. They, they may not be getting information like everyone else because they don't speak English. Yeah. You don't watch television all day, but if you can't speak English, you know, it doesn't help you much. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, in a funny way, it's the same thing in a hospice or re rehabilitation center. You know, people are beyond the ordinary streams of information. You, Larry, and your coworkers, you are their, you know, their information provider. So how do you see that? What do you do about it? What kind of a message do you give them? Um, what do you What do you want them to uh, to understand and know about? Well, I think the first thing is the limitations on what we know that we do and don't know everything about it. Um, the second thing is that uh, things are being done to to figure it all out and how how to best position ourselves for health and well-being in this in the setting right now. Third is that uh, um, the virus, when it's, as I know, when it's external, is really very vulnerable. So these, these precautions that we're talking about, washing hands, making sure you don't touch your face, uh, being cleaning surfaces all over and keeping those clean, all those precautions, um, uh, although they, they don't, they're not elaborate, they're very simple, but because the virus is not that healthy, I mean, that strong, it can be, it, we can, those are good, good means of protection. But these standard procedures, well, let me let me back up a minute. My, my uh, wife uh, 
was a dental is a dental hygienist. And when we uh, when the HIV came around, she was treating HIV patients. Um, and I said, what do you do? And she said, well, the virus is vulnerable. <clears throat> and after every patient, I do the same alcohol cleansing of my operatory, the whole operatory. <laughs> Uh, and I make sure that I cover every space, every surface, and that's a standard procedure. Of course, she wore she wore mask and she wore gloves and those other barriers between skin and, and her body and the externals. So I think I would bring some sense of reassurance too, Jay, that that um, the standard procedures that we have, uh, when practiced and done um, faithfully. <laughs> and continuously and routinely it, they, it are very protective um making sure that the surfaces are clean making sure hands are washed making sure faces are clean um and making sure that we uh we don't expose ourselves unduly can i share Let me give you a, a, hypo a hypothetical uh hypothetical larry uh, so now you have a patient the patient's in the hospice the patient is doesn't have a long time to live the patient has other issues that are that are going to be uh, fatal um and somehow the virus gets to that patient and now we have shortness of breath we have um you know a fever we have an inability to to, to breathe properly all that uh and you know the, all of the touchstones you mentioned are are met or at least a number of them are and, and any rational person now knowing what we know would conclude you know that this is pretty sure this is going to be the virus and given the fact that this individual is vulnerable very vulnerable to start with um you know n now we're going to have to you know take him to a hospital for her and uh, and let them try to save him but knowing of course that you put somebody in a ventilator this is the national statistic and uh, about half the people who go on ventilators don't come off ventilators. That's there. That's it for them. And and for the people you're talking about in the in the hospice or rehabilitation hospital, it's not likely they're going to survive. So um, you're a hospice worker. You're a kind and gentle man. Uh, you're a man who is tremendously empathetic. That's the nature of your life on the planet. Um, what do you say to this patient who's already? Uh, you know, in, in the last chapter, what do you say when you come to the conclusion that that this person has the virus and will not be able to see his or her family again? What do you say? What do you say? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to know how you feel about it. How, how are you feeling about this disease? What's what's going on in your own soul about this? How much aware of how are you? What are you aware of? Are you aware that this is evidence of covid and does that i mean i wouldn't men i wouldn't even mention the disease i would just wonder if they know about it how much they know and how much they don't know and then move from there um, the feelings of of loss begin to set in it's what's called anticipatory grief of course and the per the patient can then begin to grieve intensely about not being able to see the family about not being able to recover and uh, that anticipatory grief is in, uh, expressed in many ways. I mean, some people press it down, of course. They don't want to bring it out. So my question, my challenge then is, do I try to suggest things that would open that up and say, have you thought about this as being more, bringing you closer to the end of your life? Have you thought about what that means for you? and? How does that touch you emotionally if, to think that you might not be able to to see your family again? So those are the kinds of things that I begin to explore, Jay, and try to do it gently. Um, mm -hmm. There's always, everyone has a right to deny what's going on in their lives. You know? And so we'll, we'll find, out a lot, find a lot of denial of people who say, I just don't want to deal with it. And maybe if I can deny it, it'll go away. There's a certain kind of uh, um, bargaining that sets in. Uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross's five stages of, of dying become evident. And sometimes they can move through those in very quick manner. But um, to be, uh, to listen to that, uh, what, what are they going to discover as they share with, share with the hospice worker what's going on? And it may not be me. It may be they, maybe the CNA who comes and cleans their Cleans, cleans their diaper, you know, and, uh, changes their diaper, cleans, 
that uh, we listen with that kind of compassion um, <clears throat> so that we're a companion rather than trying to teach something else. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, it's the person who holds hands, although it's, it's hard to hold anybody's hand um, with this contagion. The, the last question right. I want to ask you, Larry, which is something that, you know, has just occurred to me is that, you know, you deal with people who are dying all the time. And you know, that's your place in life these days. And, and then, in fact, you're a minister that, you know, is part of it. And, and, um, and you know, up till now, up till January, February of 2020, it's been, you know, a certain ball of wax for you doing this. Okay, now the ball of wax has changed. Now there's another element in, in, the, in the calculus here um, that you have another risk that changes it and um, something you have to watch for, something you have to protect yourself against and something that would be really final as soon as the diagnosis is done because this person really can't engage with anybody in the same way no matter what his or her condition is in the last chapter it's yeah. changed and my question is how has it changed for you you start out empathetic and now you're in this tremendous risk zone and wow how has it changed for you well it it sounds selfish perhaps but i certainly do want to protect myself because i'm in that um i'm in that uh, kapuna area <laughs> i'm in that uh, possible vulnerable zone myself i've had some some um, respiratory issues i've had i've had my share of those and i have also of course i'm 71 year now and next month and uh, children that uh, i call them they call me now because i've introduced them to that beautiful word um so i'm very conscious i don't I, I have to be very conscious of those things that i've described already that are preventive and um so that's the first thing the second thing for me is is that uh the, the dying process for my patients may be tremendously sped up you know accelerated tremendously if they get this virus because it doesn't last long it just if it peaks quickly it takes it seems to take them fast so um so i can be a help to the family at that point that's probably a more important focus than the patient themselves am i making sense yeah in a funny way it makes you all the more important it makes you a uh, part of the process uh, and it makes you it makes you re, re, revisit your your whole role here because uh, the stakes have changed larry grimm uh, hospice worker par excellence extraordinaire thank you so much for joining us here on aging and grace this is one one hell of a time we live in thank you larry